So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about um, phase-based connectivity uh, methods. There are, in fact, quite a few uh, different ways of analyzing connectivity data uh, or looking, analyzing your data for connectivity using um, different phase-based metrics. So I'm going to go into detail about um, one method that I think is really the dominant uh, method. And then in the end, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some other uh, at least one other class of methods. Um, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about a method that I call intersite phase clustering. Um, it has also variously been called um, uh, phase synchronization or phase coherence or um, phase uh, phase locking value and uh, <laughs> other terms that I think are just not coming to mind now. Um, the terminology can get a little bit confusing because many people use the same term uh, or different terms to indicate uh, the same analysis. But anyway, there's uh, not a whole lot you can do about it except try it to be as, as clear as possible. The reason why I like uh, this term, intersite phase clustering, is because it's really just a uh, description of the method that is being applied to the data. It's not really an interpretation um, per se. I think that the interpretation of a finding should be independent of the actual um, analysis that's being applied to the data. <clears throat> anyway, um, this method is extremely similar to um, intertrial phase clustering. So if you are not familiar with intertrial phase clustering, um, or if you forgot all about it because you watched that video a long time ago or something, um, I recommend uh, going back and watching that video or reading more about uh, inner trial phase clustering before um, doing the rest of uh, this lecture. Okay, um, just very briefly a little bit about uh, the backgrounds of the um, ideas in neurophysiology that, uh, that inspired this way of, of looking for connectivity in, uh, in uh, neural time series data. So if you were to lower a, uh, a small electrode, a microwire into the brain, or even well, also recording from EEG, of course, um, the signal that you would record, the electrical signal would be strongly oscillatory over time. Um, and these, uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the major um, uh, motivating forces behind doing time frequency analyses. Um, it is, uh, generally believed in, in neuroscience that um, <clears throat> when two different uh, brain regions or two different um, uh, populations of neurons are working together when they are coordinating uh, information processing or sending information back and forth, their um, electrophysiological oscillatory activities can become um, synchronized, can become uh, uh, time-locked to each other. Um, so this is the motivation for doing uh, phase locked based analyses and frequency specific uh, connectivity analyses. Um, in fairness, I should mention this is not like established fact in neuroscience that there is synchronization and that promotes interregional communication. It's uh, it's a it's a theory that uh, well it's a, a set of theories that goes back you know many decades uh, and there's quite a bit of data but it's. Uh, it's still in some pockets of neuroscience, still a bit of a contentious idea. Anyway, so the idea of computing intersite phase clustering um, is that you extract the phase angle time series from two different um, electrodes, um, uh, or two different brain regions I see here, but it's really just two different electrodes. Um, and now what you want to look at is how much are these two um, phase angle time series clustering uh, over time or over trial. So that's a detail I'll get back to later. So now if you remember from inner trial phase clustering, I had a picture that looked like this, but these were two different trials. Um, so now what we see is these are, this is the same trial, but um, two different electrodes. And so each line here corresponds not to the phase angle from a single electrode uh, at one time point, but instead to the phase angle difference between two electrodes uh, at one time point. So this angle here, and you can see, of course, these are unit uh, vectors. So we strip the amplitude information away. We're just looking at the phase, which is really just about the timing. So this one vector here, this one line here, 
would correspond to, for example, uh, this time point. And then it's the difference in the phase angle, literally the subtraction of this phase angle from this phase angle. Okay, so here um, I have some um, two time series. I, I don't remember where I got this from, but it, might, it was many years ago. It might even be just simulated data. But anyway, we can kind of uh, conceptually break this thing apart into three different sections. And now what I want you to think about is, is there synchronization or relatively strong versus weak synchronization in uh, these three different periods? So most people generally agree that uh, there is synchronization here. It's not perfect synchronization, but you never have perfect synchronization in a complex system like the brain. And here there seems to be, uh, yeah, I don't know, no synchronization or at least relatively weak synchronization compared to here. And here is where people sometimes get confused. And there's always a, in any, you know, sufficiently large group of, of people, there's going to be some people who think that there is synchronization and some people think that there isn't synchronization. In fact, I would say, uh, and many other people would say, and the math says that this um, is a period of synchronization. It's just anti-phase synchronization. So this guy goes down while this guy goes up and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see later in MATLAB that this measure of phase synchronization is completely invariant to the phase angle. So you can have just as much synchronization when you are in phase versus out of phase. So <clears throat> here to make uh, this point about phase angle differences a bit more clear, um, I have data, now this is not simulated data, these are real data, um, from two pairs of uh, electrodes. Um, one pair that's relatively far away and one pair that is very, very close to each other. And here you see this is filtered, uh, yeah, I guess in the alpha band. Um, here you see the two uh, colors, the lines correspond to the two different electrodes. Um, and same thing here. And here you see the phase angle time series from the two electrodes. Of course, FP1 and FP2 look extremely similar to each other. These two electrodes are sort of like uh, at the top of the forehead. Um, and they're very physically close to each other. Um, so in fact, they measure, you know, nearly identical activity, but it's largely because of volume conduction. So you, you wouldn't really interpret this as reflecting true brain connectivity, but I think precisely because there is this artifact of volume conduction, it's very useful as, uh, as an illustrative uh, example to, to, so you can see what it looks like when phase angles from two different time series are synchronized. And here you see the synchronization is much weaker. Um, here in the bottom plot, you see the phase angle differences. And here you see the phase angle differences are basically all clustered around zero. Sometimes you get these jumps, uh, but you can see this jump is actually just going to two pi, which is really zero. So we'll see um, soon uh, that uh, this is just sort of bouncing up and down. This, these, this point and these points are actually very close to each other. Uh, so, um, so here we see again something very similar. Uh, these are in fact two different electrodes. It's a little bit difficult to hear. You can make out the two different ones. Again, same concept. I use PZ and P1 um, intentionally to illustrate the difference between uh, phase angles and phase angle differences. And so here you see all of the different phase angles over time. So each, um, each vector is a time point. Uh, and the, the gray is from one electrode and the black, which is underneath, is from the other electrode. And you see, of course, this is not surprising. When you go over time, there's many, many cycles. And so the phase angles are just absolutely all over the place. If we would compute the mean phase angle, it would probably be zero or extremely close to zero, um, which is not surprising. Look how many cycles we have here. But now you see the phase angle uh, differences between these two electrodes over time are not uniformly distributed. They're in fact very strongly clustered all around zero. And you know, again, this is all around zero because probably most of this connectivity here is just because of uh, volume conduction. So it's an artifact of these two electrodes being very close to each other and measuring the same thing. Maybe some of this is genuine brain connectivity, but I certainly wouldn't interpret this in any sort of 
real context, uh, but you can see that the phase angles themselves are going all over the place. The phase angle differences are very strongly clustered. So, um, since you are uh, experts in inner trial phase clustering, um, the equation for intersite phase clustering should be very familiar to you. <coughs> um, this is, well, okay, I wrote equation, but this is actually the MATLAB implementation of the equation, but that's okay. Um, you should recognize uh, Euler's formula in here. So it's e to the ik. Now, before we had um, k being the phase angles over trials. And now here we have the phase angle differences between two different electrodes. So uh, we collect all the phase angles, we Eulerize them, so we put them into this uh, polar space as unit vectors. Um, and then here we take the average of those, uh, of those unit vectors. And then we take the length. And it is literally this length of the average of all the vectors that we take as our, as our estimate of the, or measure of the strength of connectivity. So here's the slide where you see that uh, this measure of uh, phase clustering is invariant to the um, phase. So what I've done here was take the same phase angle distribution as before um, and just add some random phases to it. So it just, you know, sort of randomly jumps around on the circle. And you can see that the, the measure of phase clustering, which we take as a, uh, an index of, of, of a frequency specific functional connectivity, this thing is exactly the same regardless of the direction where the distribution is pointing. So it's phase invariant. All right, so let's take a look at this in MATLAB. We load in our favorite sample data set. <clears throat> Um, here, basically what I'm going to do is recreate one of these figures that I just showed you. Um, but actually one of these figures was just the final frame of a movie. So um, here we get to see the whole movie. Um, again, using channels P, Z, and, and P1. And uh, you should, of course, feel free to change these to any other electrode and you can see how it looks. So on <clears throat> this cell, um, there is uh, basically just code that sets up the plot um, that is that is going to be controlled over time um, in this loop down here which starts on line 92. So I'm not going to go through um, all of the details of how this plotting works but if you are curious to see how to make uh, movies in MATLAB this is like a, a very simple uh, movie nothing you know Hollywood or Bollywood would be remotely interested in but that's okay. Um, but if you want to see like, you know, a, the basic uh, way to, you know, to create stimuli that change over time in a MATLAB figure, then you can inspect this code um, uh, in more detail on your own. So, but if you run this code, basically it's just going to make a, a, a movie of the figure we saw before. So you see very quickly these phase angles just go distributed completely uniformly. Um, whereas the phase angle differences are really just clustered, uh, in this case, very close to zero. Here I have um, this uh, skipping unit here is five. So that just means I'm skipping by five time points. So you can speed it up or slow it down, you know, by changing uh, this value. So that's very pretty, you know, uh, it looks very nice. <laughs> uh, nice colors, of course. So now let's do something a little bit more quantitative. Um, now we are actually going to compute the, <coughs> the intersite uh, phase clustering. So here um, on line 120, I compute the phase angle differences. And again, it's really literally just the differences in the, in the phase angles. Um, it's important when you're doing this to make sure that you are subtracting the, um, the phase angles in radians and not the complex values. So not the result of uh, Morley wave-like convolution. So that you see here. Um, here we do um, uh, some, uh, yeah, just normal convolution, uh, Morley wave-like convolution for uh, one frequency. And then we take the angle of the analytic signal, and that's what we call this uh, variable phase data. So when I get down here and I compute the difference between these, this is the difference in the phase angles um, not the difference in the uh, complex uh, uh, values. Mm -hmm.
Okay, and then we eulerize the phase angle difference, and then we take the mean, and then we take the magnitude of the mean. So this is done, this is separated into four lines of code, uh, just for, you know, just to make sure that it's very clear that you see what's happening step by step. Of course, in practice, you can do all of this in one line, which you see here on line 134. <coughs> So we can plot this and it tells us that the um, synchronization between these two electrodes is 0.95 and here is the average vector which is almost a unit vector um, because these are really you know non-physiologically plausibly um, uh, clustered. If you actually see a connectivity value of 0.95 in your data then you should be extremely suspicious that something went wrong uh, or or do you have a, a big artifact in the data? I think more realistic values, particularly at the level of EEG or MEG, you know, measuring outside the head, is somewhere around, you know, 0.2 or 0.3, maybe up to 0.4 if it's like a really strong effect. Um, but I think anything above 0.5 or 0.6 is likely to be um, influenced by volume conduction. So you should be cautious about strong values. Um, here, what I wanted to show is that um, this measure of phase synchronization is a is non-directional. It's a, it's a symmetric measure of phase synchronization. We can say subtract the phase angles from channel two minus channel one, or channel one minus channel two, and we get exactly the same result. So this is 0.95, and this is also 0.95. Okay. Um, then this next figure uh, generates the um, the figure I showed where you see that it's uh, the distribution or the measure of connectivity is, is phase invariant. So yeah, that's actually not super interesting code, I think, but uh, let me see. Is there anything interesting? Not really. So I just, you know, uh, add random uh, phase values in here to the distribution and then recompute the um, synchronization. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about now briefly is computing uh, intersite phase clustering over trials versus over time. And this is already um, an issue that I've discussed before. Um, so I won't go into it in too much depth. <clears throat> I believe it was the previous video actually where I, uh, where I um, defined these two terms and talked about them a little bit in, uh, in more detail. Um, but just very briefly, we can collect these phase angles either over time, and then we get a measure of connectivity per trial. So this would be one trial, and these are the phase angle differences between two electrodes in this one trial. Or we can measure um, ISPC over trials, and there we get one estimate of connectivity per time point. Okay, so when you compute over trials, what you're essentially doing is um, populating these uh, this uh, distribution of phase angles at each time point over trials. So here we have uh, um, three different uh, trials and then we have three different uh, angles. I don't know. Oh, right. Yeah, I <laughs> did this to illustrate that it's uh, two electrodes at each uh, trial. So it would be the difference. At, so the angle here would actually be the difference between uh, these two angles uh, for these two um, uh, faux electrodes. Okay, <clears throat> so when should you prefer one over the other? I talk about this in more detail in the book, but just very briefly, um, looking at connectivity over time is better for resting state or really long tasks. So long would be like if there's like a, uh, if it's a working memory task, for example, and you have a delay period of like eight seconds, you wouldn't really imagine that uh, the um, phase-based connectivity can be um, phase-locked to, or you know, sort of time-locked to a stimulus for for many seconds. It's going to be more for many hundreds of uh, milliseconds. Um, in resting state, of course, you can't do over trials because there are no trial, or there's no sort of inherently meaningful uh, definition of trials for resting state data. <clears throat> 
Um, so uh, that doesn't mean you don't get any temporal information when you compute connectivity over time. You can compute them in sliding windows, um, which might be better for higher frequencies if you think that uh, the synchronization between these frequencies, uh, or sorry, between these two electrodes at higher frequencies is uh, not going to have exactly the same phase value over uh, trials. So and in contrast, uh, ISPC over trials is um, I think the best approach for like standard, you know, cognitive trial based tasks. Um, it can fail to detect real synchronization if the phase angles are different across trials. That's because um, for um, ISPC over trials, you need not only for the um, for the phase angles to be consistent uh, between the two electrodes, you need the, the angle at which they're pointing to be consistent over um, trials. So I think this kind of makes sense intuitively that it, that it should be like this, but it doesn't sort of necessarily uh, need to be like this. If you don't know what to do, if you have a standard, you know, sort of uh, trial based uh, cognitive task design, I would say go for um, ISPC over trials. That's the, the thing that, you know, is, is more frequently done in the literature. And if you're computing it over time, then, you know, that would be just for resting state. Yeah, like I said here. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, here we uh, have, well, a, again, a standard uh, wavelet uh, com uh, convolution approach. And there's already some red stuff down here. You can try running the cell. Of course it crashes. It crashes on these key lines here uh, where we compute. Um, so this is line 207 and 214 where we compute um, ISPC over trials or ISPC over time. Now, if you look at these lines of code, you can see a little. it's a little bit different from the code I used earlier. So, well, first of all, the um, let's run this stuff. So now we need all the single trial data because we, well, we need all the single trial data and all the trial data. So now this uh, variable phase data is two by 640 by 99. The two, the first dimension corresponds to electrodes. So we only have uh, two electrodes here. <clears throat> the 640 of course is time points and the 99 is trials. So we know that we want to take the difference along the first dimension, right? So that's the difference between the trials, uh, the difference between the channels, sorry. So before I did phase data, you know, we can go up here and see how I did this before. Uh, phase data one minus phase data two. But because I know that we only have uh, two uh, electrodes here, we can actually just compute the derivative over the first dimension. It may seem a bit weird at first, but this is the derivative here is the diff function. It's really just computing the difference along the first dimension because that's the one I specify here. So we take the phase angle differences um, and then we Eulerize them. And now here's the key thing. Now we want to take the average and then the length of the average vector. But what do we want to take the average over? Which dimension do we want to take the average over? Um, so if you like, you can pause the video and see if you can finish these lines. Let's see if I can even finish these lines. So we know this one's going to be trials. So we want to average over uh, trials, which is the third dimension. So I think this first one is for EXP and then comma three for mean and then ABS. And now here we want to um, average over the second dimension. I get that right? Yeah, over the second dimension, uh, which is going to be time. So now these results are a little bit different. Before looking at the plot, let's just look at the variables. You can see ISPC trials is a one by 640 vector. So it's uh, one by time. So it's basically just a, a time vector. Whereas ISPC time is a 99 element uh, vector, which corresponds to trials. So now there's no time in this one because we're computing it over time per trials. And so this is what you see here. So here's ISBC. This is time now on the um, x-axis in this top plot. Uh, 
Um, and now you see, so first of all, again, these values are extremely high. So, you, you know, you don't really want to interpret these results in a, like a sort of neurophysiological way, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> but here we see this is the time course of, uh, of connectivity between these two electrodes relative to stem onset. And these uh, data reflect the, you know, the, the sort of consistency of the synchronization over trials at each time point. Now here, what we have is, on the lower plot, we have the ISPC over trials. So now each individual time point is actually the strength of the connectivity from the entire time period, the entire trial period, just for one trial. So you can see, you know, on trial 51 or whatever, there was really strong connectivity. And on trial 58, there was really a uh, rel relatively weak connectivity between these uh, two electrodes. So now in this plot, you get no um, temporal information, uh, but you do get trial information. So this would be useful, you know, let's say you wanted to correlate uh, reaction time with connectivity and see if trials with, I don't know, stronger connectivity have faster reaction times or something, then that's um, another example where you would need to do this uh, method instead of um, connectivity over trials. Okay, so that's all about uh, phase clustering based methods. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk just a little bit about um, phase lag based methods. This is um, a whole class of um, of connectivity analyses. Um, so there's like the, the phase lag index and the weighted phase lag index and the, um, the PSI, which is the phase slope index. And I think there's a few others that are, are not coming into my head at the moment. The idea here is this is all about volume connection. I've talked about volume connection before. Um, and uh, and I've mentioned the word volume connection already like a dozen times in this lecture, emphasizing that, you know, when we pick, particularly without applying the Laplacian or any kind of spatial filter, when we pick neighboring electrodes, you really can't interpret the connectivity between them uh, because of volume connection. So the th interesting thing about volume connection is that um, it's instantaneous. Um, and that means that um, activity from a source in the brain will contribute to different electrodes with zero time lag. So um, the, then, so then the, the thinking is that any connectivity you see between these two that has zero phase lag, this can be attributed to volume conduction. And this is why you see uh, this distribution here. I think this was the real one you can see they're all clustered around zero. And so this reflects really very strong uh, volume conduction. Um, so now the question is, you know, uh, or I guess the, the issue is that um, volume conduction is, uh, or there's also true uh, zero phase connectivity in the brain. So if you see zero, fa zero phase like synchronization, or also um, pi synchronization. This would be just if you're measuring on opposite sides of the dipole. If you see zero or pi um, uh, phase lag synchronization, it could either be um, a volume conducted artifact, or it could be um, true connectivity that just has a, uh, that's just very very fast. It has a very um, small uh, time lag. So the idea of these phase lag based measures is to say, you know what, why don't we just completely ignore um, any uh, connectivity that has a, uh, a zero phase lag. And maybe, you know, that means we're also um, failing to detect some meaningful connectivity, some true, um, very fast connectivity or zero phase lag connectivity. But at least we are not uh, also going to falsely detect um, uh, spurious connectivity via volume connection. So basically the way that um, these work, and there are several different methods for these um, phase lag based techniques, they work slightly differently, um, but they all have the same principle, which is that they are not really focused on um, clustering per se, more they are focused on um, uh, whether the phase angles are consistently 
you know, the phase angle differences are consistently basically away from zero or pi. Um, and the way that this works with the PLI, the phase lag index, for example, is just whether they're all pointing up or whether they're all pointing down relative to the uh, relative to the real axis. So here's the case. You can see that all the vectors are pointing um, positive uh, on the real axis, or sorry, the uh, imaginary axis. Um, they're all pointing up, um, and so the the phase lag index would be one. Um, so perfect synchronization. Although you know when you look at phase clustering, you see that well they're not perfectly clustered. So the clustering value is you know 0 0.6. Um, here you see another case. It's exactly the same distribution, but I just spun it around so it's pointing to the right. So now the phase clustering is exactly the same. That's no surprise. We saw that already. Um, but the phase lag uh, index has gone to zero, um, and this happened because you can see half of the angles are pointing up and half of the angles are pointing down. Um, here again is the same uh, concept. So this is just showing that, uh, well, basically this slide shows that the phase lag index and um, phase clustering based methods will, they can give you more or less the same result in some situations, uh, but they can also give you very different results in other situations. Um, uh, so here is a situation, for example, where you would also see them uh, decoupled. If you have the phase angle difference that's spinning around the circle over time, so imagine these, uh, this sort of collection of vectors is spinning around this polar sphere over time, uh, or the circle over time. This can actually happen if the, um, if the frequencies are slightly mismatched. So if one electrode has a little bit more energy in a slightly higher frequency than the other electrode, they will um, spin around like this. And this is something that you can observe in, uh, in empirical data. And maybe some of this is noise, maybe some of this is kind of the true state of the brain. You know, we, it is known that there are um, multiple um, uh, frequencies, uh, even like neighboring frequencies in the brain, and also that frequencies can fluctuate over time, they can change over time. So these sorts of things can happen. And as it's and as these this distribution spins around pi and zero, you will see these, uh, these very sharp dips in um, phase lag based measures, which you won't see in um, phase clustering. Um, so I uh, ran some simulations, you can find here's the reference just to look at, you know, kind of compare these two different classes of, uh, of connectivity methods more directly. And um, I'll just tell you the punchline in the interest of time. You can, you can read the paper if you like uh, the details. But the short version is that ISPC um, is, of course, sensitive to volume conduction, so that's not very surprising. Um, and um, even in this baseline period, so you can see this is you know, there is no simulated connectivity between two different brain regions that's measured by these two different uh, electrodes before time zero. So, and this dotted line here is the zero line. So this distance from here, this is all artifact. Um, this is with the average reference, this is with the Laplacian. So what you should see is connectivity uh, between this electrode and this electrode. And all of this connectivity here, this is volume conduction artifact, um, and this is all interpretable connectivity. So you can see the Laplacian uh, does a pretty good job at providing interpretable connectivity data, assuming that you don't interpret uh, the nearest neighbors from the electrode. So if we would exclude these uh, neighbors around the seed electrode, this map would be interpretable. This is all real connectivity, or well, simulated real connectivity. Here is phase lag. Um, you can see there's zero connectivity. There's no um, artificial um, uh, spurious connectivity estimate um, uh, around the seed electrode. So we can only we selectively recover um, just what 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 should be there in the in the data. Um, and you can also see that um, before time zero, then there's no inflated connectivity the way there is with phase clustering. So this all sounds very nice. <laughs> um, it, it makes you think that, well, maybe I should use uh, the phase lag index. But there's other, I think I don't go into it here, but um, 
you can already see actually in, in these plots that uh, the, the, the phase lag underestimated the connectivity. Um, and there are other situations where the phase lag index um, and these kinds of methods in general will um, completely miss uh, true connectivity in the data, even with only very minor fluctuations in uh, or mismatches between the frequencies and physiologically plausible um, frequency mismatches between the different electrodes. So neither of these methods is um, perfect. They both have their advantages and limitations. Connectivity based on phase clustering maximizes the sensitivity to detect uh, true effects. So you will have the most amount of sensitivity, um, but it's also susceptible to volume conduction. So you have to be more careful when you are interpreting the results because you need to make sure that the results are not um, attributable to volume conduction or confounded by volume conduction. So I think that um, these clustering based, met based methods are best for um, hypothesis testing. And I, I say this generally because in, when you're doing hypothesis testing, you, you have a relatively small number of tests uh, and then you can take the time and the energy to, um, to, to look at those results very carefully and make sure that you are measuring true connectivity, not volume connection. Um, in, the, in the book, I think I also mentioned this in the last video, but in the book, there's several, um, I believe 10 uh, strategies for disentangling volume connection from uh, connectivity. So on the other hand, connectivity based on phase lag um, is uh, it, the advantage, the main advantage is that it's insensitive to volume connection. So you don't have to be concerned about this potential uh, confound in your data, um, but it, it does miss true connectivity uh, and it, it can miss quite a lot of the true connectivity. Um, so I would say that this method is better for uh, more exploratory studies where you're doing uh, a lot of um, connectivity analyses and you don't, you're not able, it's sort of impractical or impossible to go into each of, you know, hundreds or thousands of tests to, to carefully inspect the data and make sure that this is not a volume connection artifact. So anyway, uh, you can check out the paper if you want to learn more about that. So that was it. I hope you found this uh, informative and we'll continue in the next lecture with, uh, with power-based connectivity.